Thank you for joining us for this week's Paved Coffee Chat. Today's chat, What's in a Name, will be presented by Jerry Fox, President and CEO of Bish Creative. Just yesterday, Jerry celebrated his 35th anniversary of working within the point of purchase industry. He has spent his entire career at Bish Creative taking ownership of the company in 2000. Jerry and his team continue to be a global leader in creative in-store marketing and are responsible for a multitude of award-winning merchandising programs. A longtime active member of the retail design community, Jerry currently serves on the PAVE Board of Directors Executive Committee as our treasurer. In 2018, Jerry was inducted into the Shop Hall of Fame in recognition of his leadership, innovation, and dedication to our creative industry. At the conclusion of today's chat, we'll be hosting a brief Q&A. Please send in your questions using the Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen. Now, I will turn it over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Dash. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Fish Creative, we appreciate everyone's time today, and I'm going to be fun and exciting and different. So let's start off with what's in a name. Now, I'm gonna get a little personal, if you don't mind. So my name is Jerry Fox. However, my parents, when I was born, the formal name is Gerald, J-E-R-R-O-L-D. However, in the society as a whole, Gerald is usually spelled with a G. So many times I'd be asked, why did you spell it that way? And I would step back and I would say to them, well, let me think about that. You know, I did voice my opinion. I guess they just weren't listening. Why? Because I was crying because I was a baby. I had no choice in choosing that name. They did it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about the importance of a name and the importance of branding. Now, I'm a very humble guy, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this part. However, I am honored to be a part of the uh, shop industry, certainly an honor to be a part of the Hall of Fame, and most importantly, I'm honored to be a part of the big, PAVE Executive Committee. And yes, I did start uh, working at Bish Creative 35 years ago. So when I see the 35 posted everywhere, I love it because everyone says, wow, you're 35, you don't look so good for 35. But I'm not 35, it's 35 years in the business and I'm proud of that. So let's talk about building a brand. And let's talk about the two most important elements. And I'm going to go a little tongue in cheek here. I'm going to go back to the old days. Um, I happen to love the series Mad Men because it really talks about how uh, unique and different advertising was. So, but from a brand perspective, one of the things you'll clearly learn that clear and immediate communication is the key to success. Consistency and legacy is a key to success. And if, if any of you know uh, Jonathan Winters, he's in the lower left corner of your screen there, uh, he's the gentleman holding the bag of Cheetos. And I know that he wears the cleanest shirts in town. Why? Because he uses Tide, which by the way, if you look closely at that ad, Tide gets clothes cleaner than any soap. But Tide is a soap. So it's basically making a little bit of fun of itself. But advertising back then was very kitschy. Uh, just there's a pep, pep, pep in Pepsi. This one happens to be my favorite. The 1968 Plymouth is continental elegance at half the price. Now, for those that are of that genre and generation, the Lincoln Continental was also introduced during that time. So at the time, continental was also a brand, but it also could be used as an adjective. So the Plymouth people figured that out and cleverly introduced a little bit of jab at their competition, which happens all the time. So branding is very difficult because if there's too much or too little change, there's a disconnection. So the gentleman in the lower left corner is Jim Moran, the courtesy Ford man. Now, if you're from the Chicagoland area and you were born in the 50s, you would know who this guy is. I wasn't born, I'm just sharing the story with you. However, Jim Moran was the number one Ford dealer in the entire United States. He had a personality that would light up a room and he could sell more cars than anybody uh, around. Jim was then diagnosed with terminal cancer. Very scary part of his life. He gave up his dealership 
and moved to South Florida in the Miami Hollywood area, right where the shop headquarters are and the cave headquarters are. He got better. He got healthy. He came through, he beat cancer. During that time, a small little company came to his door and said, could you help us sell cars? That little company was Toyota Motor Company. He led the charge of introducing Toyota cars to America. And it, he retired and subsequently passed away, one of the wealthiest men of his time. Now, some special things you need to know about branding. Uh, you need to own the color. You need to own an identity. Every brand should have a personality. Every brand has DNA. These three examples in front of you right now, everyone knows Mountain Dew Green. You could walk into a store and within 100 feet, you know it's Mountain Dew Green. Now, Maker's Mark, I happen to be a bourbon aficionado. Maker's Mark Red, that candle red drip that is unique to their color is theirs and theirs alone. And nobody in their space would ever dare to copy that. And lastly, Vouv Clicquot. Vouv Clicquot is a very wonderful French champagne. I'm telling you a true story. If you were to sit in the Vouv Clicquot offices and reference their color as orange, you would be immediately asked to leave the room. Why? Because it's yellow. According to them, it's considered yellow. So Vouv Clicquot is yellow and use that at your next cocktail party. So now we have a little uh, game we wanna play, a little trick, and I'm gonna let Nikki jump in here in a second. So these are five uh, very common beer cans and very common beer can brand colors. So Nikki's gonna launch a little survey that's gonna allow you to determine which brand goes with which color. Good luck. At this time, you should see a poll on your screen. Please take a moment to select all the answers. Are they trick questions, Nikki? Not this time. <laughs> <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to make it to my level. How are we doing, Nick? Just a couple more to come in. All right. Multiple choice questions are the worst. <laughs> I always guess D, all of the above. <laughs> all right, let's get those last few votes in. We need some Jeopardy music in the background next time. <laughs> Little Alex Trebek. <laughs> All right. So now you should be able to see the results on your screen. It looks like. Do you want to uh, go to the next slide? Sure. So I hope you guys got 100% on your quiz today and you can enjoy Memorial Day weekend with many of these fine well-established beer brands, which number one is Budweiser, number two, Coors Light, number three, Bud Light, number four, Corona, and number five, Heineken. I hope you did well with that, and I hope you had some fun.
Okay, so let's take a moment now and do a little uh, walk down memory lane. And let's go through some of the history of some of the biggest brands and their success stories as, as consumer product goods. Coca-Cola is obvious, right? But if you look closely, Coca-Cola was founded in 1892. They have actually never changed their logo in over a hundred years and is worldwide recognized, probably even in the moon, as the most prominent brand in the world. And that's why they did proper branding, but more importantly, they stuck to their theory, their methodology. Don't get me wrong, as a person that enjoys a good Coca-Cola, they've done some twists and turns along the way, but they have quickly and swiftly gone back to branding their, their product as they did back in 1892. This is one of my favorites. This is John Kellogg's, the Kellogg Cereal Company out of Battle Creek, Michigan. You look closely in the lower corner there, there's Mr. and Mrs. Kellogg sitting there with their golden retriever, uh, reading a book by the fireplace in 1906. Kellogg's today, the script, the color, the stylings have never changed. It is still recognized as the number one cereal within the world. Has Tony the Tiger changed? Yes. Have Snap, Crackle, and Pop changed? Yes. Have other uh, characters within their portfolio of brands changed? Yes. Kellogg's, as the brand, has not changed. Not one bit. Budweiser. We spoke a few minutes about Budweiser. If you look closely at the history of their cans, uh, I as a child had a beer can collection and I did my best to find some of the oldest cans I could. But if you look closely, the Budweiser bow tie has never changed. If you were to go into a park, into a zoo, into a, a sports, sporting event, and you saw a Clydesdale horse, you would immediately assume that the, the Clydesdales are the Budweiser Clydesdales. They're synonymous, they're close to it as possible. So, and this Bud's for you. It's really, truly one of the most American stories around and good branding because why? They own the color, they own the look, they crown themselves the king of beers and they proudly display that crown on a regular basis. And then of course, we all know the story about the Campbell Soup Kids. Now I'm not gonna make fun of the Campbell Soup Kids because I think they're great and cute, but if you look closely, they were a little bit overweight and a little bit short and stocky. So in essence, the Kimballs gave the impression that if you were short and stocky and a little bit chunky, you would actually be considered healthy. Well, that's obviously not the case now and not the society you want to work with. So Campbell's actually skinny down the Campbell Soup Kids quite a bit and have really focused on Campbell's as a soup company and more of as an ingredient company. And that's where the Campbell's brand is taking. But the name, the signature, the Campbell's family has not changed their logo in quite some time, if at all. So now, now if you will, think about those brands we talked about. Think about how tried and true they were to their look, their feel, their identity, their personality, all of the things that we talked about. Now, let's go to the next level, which is the history of the biggest brands as retailers. We all know Sears. Back in the 1800s, late 1800s, Sears was just forming. It was started in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Sears was a part of American culture. And what did they do as the internet started coming alive? They started making drastic changes, drastic changes to their brand, drastic changes to their identity, drastic changes of to who they sell to. And, to, and everyone knows the story of Sears is not a good ending. It's on its last leg, it's barely alive, and it will be a retailer that will be talked about for years to come as a mistake. They made many mistakes along the way. They obviously did a lot of good things at the beginning, but they also have made a lot of mistakes. Why? They were not true to their identity and true to their brand. Macy's, my favorite holiday movie is Miracle on 34th Street. We can picture ourselves as we walk down Fifth Avenue and Broadway and see the, the balloons, the parade and Thanksgiving. 
Macy's has done a really good job of keeping themselves alive and fresh, founded in 1858. But lately, uh, they've been kind of making some changes, trying to make them look fresher, cooler, unique, sparkly, and all that stuff. They're going to have a tough time. They're going to struggle a little bit because they've got to go back and keep that identity. And truth be told, with branding, once you get off the road and you take another path, it is really, really hard to get back on that road. So I wish Macy's the best of luck. It's a fantastic store. And obviously being a point of purchase guy, I need retail to be the best it ever can be. And that's the hope Macy's is a part of that. And of course, then there's Walmart. Now as a child, Kmart, Montgomery Ward, those types of stores were considered Kresge's, were considered uh, value stores, places to go to get all your goods at one spot at a very good price. The Walton family started Walmart in 1962. In, in math, that's not that long ago because probably about the year I was born. So Walmart has done a really good job of making their brand relevant today. And they still keep it alive, they still keep it fresh, they still are identified. People can recognize the color blue, the star, the type font of Walmart going forward. So Walmart will be one of those that will continue on and thrive well into the future because they have stuck true to their selves. And then of course there's Tiffany. Now Tiffany is, is fantastic in its um, unique teal blue color. And Audrey Hepburn peeking through those teal blue blinds is a, a memorable uh, for the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. Now Tiffany is a luxury brand. Now that's a category that we are concerned about. Will luxury marketing be, be as successful and as impactful as it always has been for the, for, with a new economy, with a new way of working? Uh, Tiffany's is staying true to their colors, true to their identity. So they're going to stay true to their brand, which by the way, all of these examples, food, uh, jewelry, uh, general merchandise, will all evolve into a solid online uh, shopping experience as well, as long as they stick to branding etiquette and keeping things concise, unique, and different. So now we're going to take a few minutes and go over um, the history of some of the biggest online retailers. These, this one has happened to me my favorite. So now if you look closely, uh, in, this was founded in 1999, and it's overstock.com. Now, just think about this for a minute. If you read the words carefully, overstock means something that you bought too much of that nobody wants. So if you buy something that nobody wants, it's considered overstock. Yet overstock has figured out a way to make their product and services uh, stand out amongst the rest. All of us in some way, shape or form have purchased overstock items and, and it's worked out well. So will the online brand of the future last a hundred years? That's the big question. Because if you look back at some of those original food references, the Campbell's, the Kellogg's and so on, they have managed to be relevant a hundred plus years later. Retailers, no, stay back please. Uh, retailers such as uh, Walmart will continue to grow. However, Sears and Macy's will have a tough time growing, going forward into the retail world as it comes to uh, online. So the perfect combination of online and brick and mortar is really the key to success here. And I wouldn't be surprised if sometime in the near future, much like Amazon, uh, that Overstock becomes a store uh, brick and mortar experience as well. Now, uh, Grubhub. Grubhub is relatively new. It's been founded since uh, 2004. And here's the concept behind Grubhub. They speak to many restaurants, chain restaurants, uh, local restaurants, family restaurants, 
and they ask them to sign up to be a Grubhub account in exchange for 20 to 30% of the cost of the sale of goods goes back to Grubhub and not to the restaurant. Now, I cut my teeth in the restaurant industry and I understand it pretty well. Most owners, most franchisees, most uh, chain developers were absolutely adamant about this concept, not accepting it. They said to themselves, why would I give up 20 to 30% of my sales to a delivery service? And I may even have to pay the delivery guy. They're just providing the service. Well, as we live through this pandemic, their service has grown dramatically. The use of their service has gone ex exceptionally well and they are, are growing at a fast pace. Now, does a Grubhub have any life as a brand in brick and mortar? I don't know. That remains to be seen because as they develop their brand and their personality behind their brand, they very well could be a restaurant in the future called Grubhub and you could get some of their best and greatest in, uh, items on the store. Now, Fish Creative, the company that I own, uh, has spent the majority of our time in the beer, wine, and spirits industry. So we know the beer, wine, and spirits industry like the back of our hand. And we feel confident that the Jameson whiskeys, the Budweiser beers, the Stag's Leap wines of the future need to have some kind of retail theater, some type of retail existence, so that it can continue to grow and capture the consumer's marketing brand. Why? Because when you walk into a liquor store or a liquor department at a grocery store or, or mass merchant store, there are literally hundreds of brands to stand out. So how do spirits and wine brands stand out? Cracking rum. We, we were integral in the introduction of the Kraken Tentacle, which grabs the consumer and sells a black spice rum that is very good and very potent, but it's all about releasing the Kraken. So we're thinking as a marketer that this is an industry that would not be affected by online because in the United States in particular, there is a three-tier system to beer, wine, and spirits marketing. It has to be made by the manufacturer, Budweiser, the Wine Group, Constellation Spirits, you, you name it, they pick up. They have to sell everything through a third party distribution network. Why? Because you can add another layer of tax on there. So the distributor, the, the manufacturer of that product sends it to the distributor, distributor slaps a tax on it, and then he turns around and sells it to a retail store or chain, who then also adds a tax to it. And then once it gets into the consumer's hands, there is another tax on it. Why? It's a sin, considered a sin product and it's, they have no problem taxing it. So how could a drizzly in this world come to life as a brand that sells alcohol so conveniently that you're one click away? They've mastered it. Why? They set up relationships with all of the local liquor stores in the areas that they serve. And by doing so, they're able to have the, the vast arrangement of products and services quickly available so that it's one or two uh, hours delivery, perhaps the, that next day, perhaps at night, whatever the case may be. The bottom line is Drizzly has figured out a way to sell every brand of beer, wine, and spirits to the consumer online. So I'm no genie or fortune teller, but I can tell you this, as this particular brand continues to grow and grow and grow, Drizzly will start putting up stores so that they can now avoid that middleman. So it's brilliant marketing on their part. You know, 
And I love the ad that alcohol never solved anything, but Drizzly did. Get the door, it's the liquor store. Those are really uh, clever experiences out there. So uh, I still recommend as a point of purchase marketer that you go to the store and relax and, and enjoy your shopping experience. And once this pandemic is over, uh, I believe that's going to be the case, but watch out for brands like this, because again, they are a color and identity and they're common to their service. So a couple of new uh, fun and interesting things that I've uh, been following lately. So have anybody heard the story of Pasquale's pizza and wings? So Pasquale uh, went uh, under the auspices of being a home delivery service or uh, for pizza and wings and things of that nature. However, the pizza and the wings were coming from Chuck E. Cheese. Now, I have nothing against Chuck E. Cheese, but I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that many of you would not consider Chuck E. Cheese a go-to destination for pizza and wings. So they turned around and put Pasquale, who by the way, that's the name of the mouse, uh, the, the character mouse that they use, his name is Pasquale, and turned it into this pizza. And they've been selling a ton of delivery pizza under this name for the past six weeks. And consumers are finally figuring it out there's obviously some consumers that are upset by it. There's obviously consumers that are scratching their head and saying, this was a brilliant marketing move. McDonald's, my brother spent 45 years working for McDonald's. And back in the day, they would make their French fries with animal fat or lard. Now, fast forward, they switched to vegetable oil. Consumers were screaming for a healthy alternative and their research was telling them that consumers want to eat healthier. But nobody wanted anybody to cut into the French fries at McDonald's. Why? Because they taste so good. So what McDonald's did was change to vegetable oil six months prior to announcing to the world that they were switching, that they were switching uh, to vegetable oil. So when the critics came out and said, you can't uh, do that, we want it made from the way it's always made, I'm used to my McDonald's french fries tasting the way that they taste and I need to keep that. McDonald's proudly and kindly said to them, we've had this change months ago. So we are not going to change it, and you've already been eating them, and they are really good. So kudos to them for introducing a healthy alternative, but also strategically introducing this new additive to their product without telling the world. So now Applebee's. Uh, Applebee's 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they were considered some of the best of the best. Uh, but now, we're not always eating good in the neighborhood. We are actually trying to eat better, eat healthier, eat differently. But for some strange reason, this pandemic has geared or directed all of us as consumers to go back to comfort, to comfortable foods, comfortable uh, clothing, comfortable lifestyles. So there isn't, the stress levels are really low and the sweatpants sales are really high because that, that's now the new norm. But Applebee's has been selling under the name Neighborhood Wings for the last few months and even though they come from Applebee's. So now, if I was a critic, do I criticize them for hiding this and not being truthful and honest to their consumer or do I applaud them for being clever in introducing a quality product and then changing the name so that the perception of that product, if somebody said, okay, I'm gonna go shop local, I'm gonna buy local, I'm gonna carry out, Applebee's probably isn't going on a lot of people's lists these days. 
but neighborhood wings and Grubhub can deliver me these amazing wings. They taste fantastic. I don't know. I don't know where they came from. One of our clients is a store. Uh, this particular store uh, came to us and they had been selling wine for 10 years. And they were building these wine centers on these really sexy almond colored logier gondola. So, so picture in your mind how sexy that gondola is. Okay, okay, let's be honest with ourselves. There's nothing sexy about a gondola and cap. So they came to us and they said, what is our problem? And I said to them, I said, your problem is you are a gas station trying to sell wine. You do not look like a wine destination. So they stepped back, they pondered. We came up with a series of designs, honed in on a final design and tested it in about 50 stores. Now, if you know anything about wine distribution or some of the things I was referring to earlier, wine distribution requires multiple levels. You know, the, the wine producer, the wine distributor, and the store. This particular 50 test store study had to come to a screeching halt. Why? Because they couldn't get the wine there fast enough. They actually had 168% lift in wine sales within their department. Blew them out of the water. They were completely enamored with that. Because think about that. If I was to come to your house and bring with you, me a bottle of Josh wine, that happens to be one of my favorites, and I gave it to you and we enjoyed it at our dinner party, six feet away, of course, in our social distancing world, would you care where I bought it? Probably not, because you recognize the brand, and the brand was the key there. Now, the store, if you're a Midwesterner, you're gonna know what I'm talking about. It's called Speedway. It's a gas station, and that's it. It's a gas station convenience store, and that's where people go and people shop, and now they're having incredible wine sales. But by the way, for the record, they did not change the wine brands. They were the same wine brands that they had had back when they did sold wine 10 years ago or two years ago. And now they're having this uplifting sales in, in services. So creative marketers, students, there's a lot of students that are on this. Um, you're going to be asked to at some time in your career, what does your brand say to you? What is your brand's personality? What do you aspire to be? Are you a luxury brand? Are you a value brand? Are you a comfort brand? Are you a brand that wants to be something you're not? You know, I mean, there's some products out there that are really not good, but because of the marketing and the advertising and the branding have incredible success. Obviously, I'm not going to suggest any brands in particular because I, I don't want to offend anyone. But at the same token, um, branding and messaging that go to the branding is so important. You really need to do your homework and figure out the type fonts and the styles and the colors and things of that nature. So now let's talk about some agencies. Go ahead, Kurt. Okay, so obviously in the advertising business, there are brands such as J. Walter Thompson, Foot Conan Belding, that's what FCB stands for, Leo Burnett. All of them founded in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Bish Creative Display, my company, was founded in 1955. I love sharing this story with everyone. The founder of the company was 55 years old, when he founded Bish, he worked till he was 72. He lived to be 99. So I tell people this business won't kill you. However, if you look closely in the lower right corner and in the, and in the 1955 logo, even though I have been, as Nikki pointed out, with the 
company for 35 years, I've done a pretty good job of keeping true to the brand. Now, in my world, Bish is a kind of an odd name. It's a German nickname uh, for the family that was named Bischer. And that was his nickname. So imagine it was a small three person shop in the fifties that he started and he named it after himself. Now, fast forward 30 years later, uh, I joined the company because as a company, we are celebrating 65 years in business this month. So I ask myself as the owner, as my ancestors and my predecessors, my employees, my future, does Bish Creative have an, enough brand identity to last for a hundred years? All of us in the strategic marketing design uh, world, it's impossible. It's impossible to think to yourself that will this last a hundred years? I can't tell you what happened 10 years from now, let alone a hundred years from now. But out of respect for the Bisher family, when I took over, I could not with any good conscience change the name. Why? They were in business for 30 years. When I purchased the company, uh, it was roughly 45 years. I, they knew more than I did. They did a better job of building this brand than I did. Now we played around just like every other brand and did some changes to the brand, did some changes to the type font, did some changes to the look, even dropped the name Bishop one time uh, and just went with BCD and all of those acronyms that go into branding that make it unique and um, comforting to the, to the eye of the beholder. But we landed on Bish and we're sticking with Bish. And I just had a conversation yesterday in, in celebration of my 35th anniversary with the owner's son's wife, who uh, the owner's son recently passed away at the age of 91 and his wife was 88 years old. The joy and the satisfaction that came out of that conversation because I kept the Bish family name as part of our company really resonated with her because I am no relation to her whatsoever. So I believe wholeheartedly in brand recognition, brand identity. So whether you're a, go into the business of a consumer product good, whether you go in the business as a retailer, whether you go in the business as an online retailer, and whether you go in, into the business of an agency, the word, the branding elements of your success start from the very beginning. So use the resources around you and think about, especially during this time, I believe out of this pandemic, uh, which has really affected millions of people, will come some of the most unique, creative innovations and entrepreneurialisms that this country has ever seen. This is really a verge of a century 2000 technical revolution is what I like to call it. And many of you that are participating in this, in this event today are going to be the leaders in that. So if you are the leaders in that, or, or you're a part of something really big, you would have to be a part of the branding. Amazon, we all know who Amazon is. Think about it from a logical, branding perspective. This concept started off as an online store and had no other direction than to be the Amazon of the industry, the largest, the biggest. That's what Amazon means. So wording, coloring, texture, identity, personality, just like if you were going on a date or if you were meeting someone for the first time, you would make a list of pros and cons. So as you create brand identities and brand personalities and looks and feel, 
create a pro and con list to it. Think about what you like and what you don't like. And if you choose something, anything, and you go with your gut, and it tells you that this is the brand that you want to be, that you as a person want to be, because like I said, there's going to be a lot of entrepreneurialism that comes out of this uh, pandemic. You want it to be true to you. Just make sure that you can live with that for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, possibly a uh, hundred years. So there's a lot to think of and a lot to consider. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Nikki if you, anybody has any questions at this time or um, um, anything else that you would like to discuss. Nikki, Dash? Yeah, I've got a couple questions um, for you. Um, one, obviously brands are no longer simply products or services, but the communities of people that surround those products and services. Um, who are some of the ones that you think are, are doing uh, that the best and maybe some to kind of keep an eye out for? Well, the two uh, most common to me that come to mind, Dash, are Starbucks and, and Dunkin' Donuts. Those two particular companies have done an outstanding job of developing a store presence. At the same time, developing a store, a product identity. There's not a store that you can't walk into in this world, a Walmart, a Target, uh, a Kroger, a Safeway, a 7-Eleven, you name it. And there isn't a Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks product in there. So what is Dunkin' Donuts? What is Starbucks? Are they a product? Are they a brand? Are they a retailer? Those, those two companies in particular have done an excellent job of extending across the whole uh, branding experience. So now, one you're going to see, one of the things you're going to see going forward is a lot of retailers, the 7-Elevens, the Macy's, the um, Bed Bath & Beyonds of the world, the Walgreens are doing it now. They're going to make a high level of product mix that's going to go in their stores are going to be labeled brands that are immediately identified with the retailer. Nice. If you walk into a uh, Walgreens store now, you immediately see all your brand name in nice. Why? It's a nice word, right? But it's also developing and evolving into a brand. So you're going to identify with that. And that's one that I would say to watch out for. 7-Eleven and Walgreens have done an exceptional job in my opinion of making their stores into brands. And now if you go to a 7-Eleven and you want to grab a bag of chips, there's a very good chance that 50% of those chips in that store are 7-Eleven branded chips and you're still going to buy them. You're not going to be, because you're going to consider, even though 7-Eleven is the store, you're going to consider that brand a quality brand and you're going to purchase that product. And uh, another question is, as consumer spending has shifted from uh, discretionary purchases to more necessity purchases, um, is there anything from some of those brands that don't really fall in the necessity category that you're seeing are doing a really good job of branding and, and promoting themselves? You know, that's a, that's a, very, good, that's a very good question because uh, certain, I will say that the car dealers, in my opinion, the, the Hondas, the Toyotas, the, uh, the Fords, and all of those particular brands in particular, which are also brands that have stores, have struggled mightily because who's gonna go out and buy a car? I can't sit across from the salesperson. I'm gonna tell you right now, mark it down, write it down, whatever you choose, that the car dealership of the future will look like a Starbucks. And you will walk in there, and you will grab something to drink and you will sit down and you will peruse the cars that are available. Perhaps there's three or four out in the lot that you could take for a drive and you're gonna go through a nice little fun and friendly ordering experience and you're gonna hit, hit the button and wah, voila, there will be a car. Will that car be delivered the next day? I don't know, perhaps, right? I mean, if Amazon's figured out a way to deliver something within hours, a car dealer with all the cars that are made and the, and the restricted amount of options that they give you could literally create 
a store retail experience where a car could be ordered as easy as something on Amazon and delivered to your house the next day. Fantastic. And I think that's, uh, that's all we've got right now, unless somebody else wants to ask another question. I think that's it. Anything you could think of there, Dash or Nikki, that you'd like me to go over? I think that's it. I think that's all we've got. I appreciate it. All right. Well, I'm, like I said, on behalf of all of us at Fish Creative, and more importantly at Paid, uh, we thank you for taking part in this. I hope that you walked away with a small nugget of, um, I'll call it continental elegance, if you remember what continental elegance means, uh, and enjoyed it. It's a fun business. I came from very humble beginnings. 35 years later, I run a very successful and fun organization where the people are the key and core to our success. So to every student that's on here, I wish you the best of luck. I am sure as creative thinkers, your minds are going in a million different directions. You've had to, perhaps if you graduated, uh, from high school or college or grad school, you had, to, you had to celebrate in a different way than other people have celebrated. And now it's the spark of something new and the spark of something new going forward. So as a student, I'm anxious to see and as a consumer and a marketer, what the next 10, 20, 30 years look like, where the next podcast or webinar that I do will be from the moon and we'll live stream it to all the other moons around the, the satellites. All right, thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you, Jerry.